Hey, profs. Welcome on in. My name's Rob Lightfoot, proud two-time alum the Rick Edelman College of Communication, class of 2000-2001. This is Beyond the Brown and Gold. I'm Jessica Kennedy. I'm the co-host here, also a two-time proud Rowan alum, class of 2008 from the Rick Edelman College of Communication and Creative Arts, and 2015 from the College of Education. Thanks so much for joining us today. Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM presents Beyond the Brown and Gold, a show that highlights the lives and memories of Glassboro State and Rowan University alumni. Now, here are your hosts, Rob Lightfoot and Jessica Kennedy. On today's show, Jessica Rose. Yes, Robert William. We actually have somebody I graduated with. Yeah, I know. I'm excited about that. But I, we actually have photos together and everything in there. So t- today's show, we have John Sadak, who is, well, he's like broadcast extraordinaire, right? Mm-hmm. He currently is the voice of the Cincinnati Reds television broadcast, but he's got so many other titles too. He does Navy football. He does Westwood One, where he's caught, covered NFL games. He's done basketball for the Chicago people. No, the Chicago <laughs> Bulls. That's what they're called, the Chicago Bulls. Did you forget? Yeah, I did forget. Oh, no. But he's done a bunch of stuff. I know. He's really impressive and super down to earth. I think that might be the best part of uh, this interview is getting to know, like, you know, he's kind of a big name, like the university talks yeah. about. John a lot and his accomplishments because I think he's definitely one of those RTF grads that's um, well known but he's just a regular guy with great talents and awesome success so it's really cool to get to talk to him and get to know him more. It is my main man John P. Sadak from way downtown from Brick, New Jersey (gasps) class of 2000. John is a pretty big deal as you heard from the intro there. John I didn't know you were from Brick. Let's start with the most important thing I heard during that intro. You grew up in Brick. I grew up in um, Howell. So we were kind of neighbors. Yes. uh, Actually, uh, another Rowan Radio alumnus, Stephanie Vasquez, who now does uh, makeup for MLB Network, could be a future guest for you at, at some point. I grew up Catholic. I was raised Catholic. And the CCD that I went to by diocese was me and a bunch of kids from Howell, even though because it wasn't set up by the town lines or by where you went to school. And uh, Stephanie was a confirmation classmate of mine. Get out. See, I feel like we know each other already. Us Central Jersey folks, we have a special kinship. Did you take foreign language in middle school? And did you by chance have a Mr. McDonough? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, first of all, I couldn't remember, but yes, I know that name. Wait, are you related? He's my uncle. Get out. That is yeah. wild. Yep, that name really like is back in the nook, the crook of my nook. John, <laughs> John has so many things that he can do. Okay. I don't know if you're making that up, John, but if it's good, it will go with that story. <laughs> we're, best, we're best friends already. <laughs> I, just know, John. I just don't know. No, we start on brick. How do we find ourselves to Rowan University? Talk to us about how you decided to come here. Did you look at other schools? What you wanted to do, and and kind of uh, take us from there. Well, throughout my childhood, from the time I was really young, I wanted to work in the math or sciences. Uh, My only varsity letter in high school was on the math team. I was a JV hockey player. I was a bad rec league, everything else. Uh, But I, the more I looked into it in my senior year of high school, I was high school class in 96. The internet was a thing, but not nearly what it is today. And I went into this, uh, they used to have these big career resource job books. And at that point I wanted to be, I thought an astrophysicist. So when I took my SATs, that's the only thing I put down as a major was physics or astrophysics. And all the college letters I got were based on that. Uh, But the more I looked into it, I would likely have to get a terminal degree. I'd be in college until I was at least in my mid-20s. No matter what scholarship help I got, I'd come out saddled with some form of debt. And the more I looked into the job, the nerdy research that I liked, you don't really do. You spend a lot of the time essentially doing sales, soliciting for grant funding, doing other work. So I pivoted. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I did a presentation in my AP history class, my senior year of high school, on race relation in 20th century America. And at the core was, did Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier represent or influence a changing America? And by coincidence, in the, the main research piece I used for it was the Sports Illustrated when Arthur Ashe was named Sportsman of the Year. In that same issue was this big pullout on ESPN Sports Center. And it detailed every position that went into the show, including a sidebar on a day in the life of a production assistant. You make no money. You work crazy hours. You do everything nobody else wants to do. That's when it became tangible to me. It's like, I know I can do that job. I know I can get that job because it's a churn job. 
You do that job for six months, you prove yourself, or you get washed out or you quit. That's when I realized, wow, working in sports announcing could be a thing. Uh, because even then, I realized getting on air is really unlikely. Uh, but if I could get in doing that, my goal would be to ascend to move up. And if I didn't, I would then be satisfied being the director or the producer or the tape AD or whatever. So I, I first looked at Syracuse. That's where most sports broadcasters go to. Uh, but it was prohibitively expensive. It was a little farther away from home than I wanted. I was not offered a full ride there. And then Rowan came up really late. Actually, I knew about it because uh, there were several friends of mine from high school a year older than me were already going there. And they told me the radio station was great and the school had a, an excellent reputation. My plan was to apply, but Rob knows this pretty well. Uh, I'm a bit of a procrastinator. I, I wait <laughs> until the last minute. My mom actually let me miss a day of high school and drove me to Glassboro on the last day of applications. And I hand delivered my application that day. <laughs> you probably delivered it the, the day after and said you delivered yeah, it. Yeah, the real hero of the story here is mom, as usual, right? It's so it's coming so, in clutch. And it, you know, I got in, I got a full ride. I was offered a full tuition scholarship for my academics. But when I arrived at Rowan, I wanted to be a sports center anchor. That's what I thought I wanted to do. But then I joined the radio station by coincidence, again, uh, as fate would have it. Frank J. Hogan was my academic advisor. Frank did advising? Oh, boy. Yeah. He, no, I he advised people on. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't know he did advising when he was here. Neither did I. Yes. I had been by the station once before, and I, I buzzed, you know, the door. Nobody came. And I just kind of punted and just said, well, whatever. And then I get this gruff voicemail. John Sadak, this is Frank Hogan. I'm your academic advisor. And I'm picturing this behemoth of a man. And, and I go down and I, I see Frank, you know, and Danny DeVito behind the desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank is uh, not a, a, a tall man, I guess. Yeah, he's say. about my size. He then asked me, like, what I wanted to do. And when I described everything, he's like, why aren't you here? What, why aren't you doing this? I said, I tried. And nobody answered the door every time I came by. And he got me into the training program immediately. He knew that the, he had a number of seniors that were going to be leaving that worked in sports. And then I, when I called my first live event, I did color on a Rowan Kane basketball game in Union, New Jersey with Jason Weber, who was the sports director. I caught the bug and fell in love with doing play-by-play. -play. And from that point on, that became my goal. And that's the piece of the radio station that I really love. And we've talked about it before is that, the students, either in the major or outside the major, get real practical experience. And you, know, you can actually hone your craft here at the radio station. So, like, John was able to go do a game. And at the time, it was, you know, you're doing color commentary or doing the play-by-play. -play, and you can really build a skill set. Quite a pivot from physics. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little different. When you were younger and watching, you know, you played some sports, but when you were younger, were you were you color commentating on the sports at your house like my husband does when uh, oh, the does games he are really? Yeah, of course. Were you practicing and you just didn't even know that you were doing something that could be a job someday? No, not, not when I was a kid. Um, I mean, really, the idea of doing play-by-play -play did not become a thing until I did it at Rowan. I, and that's where I'm abnormal. Most of my peers, yes, did that. Most of them, from the time they were little kids, would turn the volume down on the TV. I didn't start doing that until I was in college. And uh, looking at sports that I didn't have a chance to call firsthand, I would do that do it off a video game or turn down the volume on a pro game I'm watching on television. Uh, but th that really didn't arrive until I first did it. And uh, it, it's unscripted theater and it became a great mental exercise and challenge. Um, you know, in, in high school, I acted a lot. I was a class actor. I had the lead in seven or eight straight plays, or the male lead at least. And there was a time where I thought I wanted to pursue that. Um, and to me, that's what play-by-play -play kind of afforded. It, it melded the two worlds of I'd always loved sports. I watched everything. I talked about it all the time. I played everything. Uh, but it has that performance flair to it as well. Rob's taking copious notes over Sorry, there. yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do it for, for later. When we do our wrap-up, I have to do this stuff. <laughs> so then, hey, John, so talk to us about your trajectory from there, from that first game and then your your you know your your time in the sports department. Uh, well, uh, as I had mentioned, there were a lot of seniors, and I didn't realize the full depths of that until late that freshman year. Uh, that they had seven regulars that were the core of the sports department, all graduating. So the timing was again incredibly lucky for me. Uh, I applied to be the sports director. I was lucky enough to be chosen for that. Uh, and then by default, because we were so thin. 
Uh, it was me, Rob Lightfoot, Jason Helder. Uh, we eventually recruited Derek Jones, poached him away from Channel 5, called the vast majority of the Rowan Athletic events for the next year plus until we can kind of grow the department again. So I, I got tremendous training by just being able to do it. Um, I, I firmly believe in the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000-hour theory in pretty much everything, and I think that's particularly true with play-by-play. Uh, while you can be taught certain elements, and yes, listening back and getting feedback is helpful, the number one teacher is do it. You have to go do it. It's uh, it's something that requires that time, and that's what Rowan and Rowan Radio afforded me, uh, and I was able to do that even through grad school. By the time I was done with my undergrad work, I recognized that the full-time jobs to do play-by-play were mostly minor league baseball, minor league hockey. And most of those full-time jobs, you doubled as the PR contact and or you did sales. And I abhorred sales. I wanted no part of sales. So the chance to get a master's in PR, I thought, was twofold. Number one, it would help my skill set in trying to apply for that kind of a job. Uh, But number two, it would provide a fallback because bluntly, our industry requires luck. You can have all the talent and have all the dedication in the world. There's only, only so many jobs and there's a ton of people that want them. And so I thought, well, what happens if I don't achieve the highest level of success? Not to the fault of my own effort or perhaps even ability. It's just circumstantial. Well, then I can do something else. I have this other skill set that I've that I've uh, evolved. I can teach. The idea of giving back and working in an academia in some way really appealed to me. And I love college. I didn't want to leave. So were you pretty much spending most of your your free time, your free time, it's not really free time when you're at the station, but were you spending a lot of your time at the station? Was there any other clubs and orgs you kind of dabbled into or were you pretty concentrated here at WGLS? No, it was almost exclusively WGLS. Um, I had a 4-0 through my uh, freshman year until an incident in a pre-calc class That involved a professor heavily deviating from his syllabus when I had a 98 (laughs) test average and uh, decided to uh, basically punt. For me, I thought I don't really need to have a great GPA. To me, there was way more value to come out of calling the games. So I didn't go to class a whole lot. Don't tell the listeners no, that he, we need our students it, but, to go to class. No, but he's being, he's so successful now. <laughs> no, oh, you're saying that not doesn't to, happen oh, for everybody. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> if there was a sports event, mm-hmm. John was involved, whether he was calling the games, um, either the play by play or doing the color commentary, he was back here producing and he wasn't doing that. So he was constantly, I recall coming back from games, John's here, you know, p- producing the pieces afterwards and was constantly involved in the, the football game. So one of the cool parts of when John's time was here was the sports, the football program, John, talk about that piece of it and how successful the program was with Casey Keeler and the experience you had with the stag bowls and such? Yeah, I mean, the entire athletic program, when uh, the late uh, Dr. Herman James was the president of Rowan, he heavily emphasized being super successful in Division Three athletics. So the football team was nationally competitive, five championship games in seven years. The women's basketball team, I covered them on their trip to a Final Four when the all-time leading scorer in men's or women's history at Rowan, Jen Demby, was the star player. Candace Crabtree was the head coach. Men's basketball was nationally competitive. That was the last Sweet 16 uh, until the run from this past season. They were, what, three Final Fours in four years in that time, right before I had arrived. Men's soccer was in a Final Four, later hosted a national championship game in a separate playoff. Field hockey won the national title. So it was making a Division Three sports program big time. Uh, there were there were pro talents. Women's softball went to the College World Series. I had a chance to cover them. Kim Wilson's team lost to uh, uh, Chapman. Rod Carew's daughter was the star hitter on that Chapman team. Uh, the late Stephanie Alaco was probably the biggest hitter on that Rowan team. And so that was really fun because the student crowds were fairly large and loud. Football was regularly 5,000 people. SB was always sold out. Baseball and softball drew really well, and they were super competitive. So that aided things a lot because you'd have that ambient crowd sound. You could feel and kind of work off of that energy. And I I think it made me better as a result. Since you called a lot of games while you were here, all sports, did you have a favorite sport to call? I mean, Rowan football is my favorite. That's what like made the made the needle move the most Uh, by far. I know I could never prove this with numbers, but I know the most listened to event that I ever announced and probably the most listened to single programming live that I have to imagine WGLS ever did 
was the uh, Rowan at Mount Union game my senior year when they snapped the longest win streak in college football history. Now, there were other bigger games. They were in five other championships. Men's basketball had won a national title. But for the most part, all those other events had some form of television or other professional live-in-the-moment medium that fans could consume through or that they would have gone to it if they wanted to see it that desperately, where the odds of them going to Alliance Ohio against Rowan's nemesis that had dominated them, had the longest winning streak in college football history, uh, where the star running back, Justin Wright, was playing on a blown-out knee. They had a freshman quarterback. They had a freshman running back that wound up getting more reps. I I think that was by far the most listened to single event. And we knew that Uh, it's something that Jason Helder, longtime friend of ours, who was a a core piece of, of Rowan radio in those times. He reminded us of right as we went on the air, like, Hey boys, this, you got more people listening to this than anything you've ever done. And, uh, and still I go back to, I've been very fortunate in a lot of the events I've been able to cover, but frequently if I'm asked something along the lines of, is there a favorite single event moment in your career it's that game it's that experience because I'm, I'm doing it with some of my best friends calling games for my college I know a bunch of the guys that are on that team and it was a monumental victory so you were super experienced at the station you were very immersed you had the opportunity to call a lot of games and get a lot of experience what were you what were you feeling when you were approaching graduation because it's hard it's hard to leave any you know experience behind especially a college experience but with all of the things that you had going for you at that time were you nervous about transitioning those skills getting a job how did you prepare for that yeah I was incredibly nervous and I recognized how daunting and competitive the the job landscape was um and that's where my own uh career ignorance was part of it um you know, I was fortunate that a guy named Ed Bankin, who's 10 years my senior, also a Rowan grad, who's part of the faculty there, uh, teaching some sports classes, uh, sports communication classes, reached out to me and informed me that there was a number two seasonal role with the Wilmington Blue Rocks that he heard was open and I should reach out to them. And I did. And it was already filled. Uh, there was no real opportunity at that time. I'd also heard there was a new team coming into Lakewood, New Jersey, the adjoining town to where I'd grown up. I wrote them, but they already had somebody in mind. And that's when I, it it all the more enhanced what I had been leaning for, that I was going to go to graduate school. And so when I went to graduate school, I purposely chose to write my thesis on PR techniques of first year minor league baseball teams at the A ball level. And I did that to enhance my candidacy for the Lakewood job. That was my real goal. Um, When I left graduate school, I wound up uh, briefly working in Atlanta in sport communication. I was an SID for a Division II league in Greater Atlanta of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. That was set up through Dr. Ed Streb, uh, who was at the time the president of the National Association of Faculty Athletic Reps. He met this rising commissioner of the league who had just been appointed, was looking for a communications guy. He recommended three people, me, Rob Lightfoot, and Derek Jones. Neither one of them were interested, even though Derek's brother lived in Atlanta. And so I wound up getting the job by default. (laughs) Wait, Rob, (laughs) biggest regret of your life? Uh, I don't know. I would have liked Atlanta. I don't know where my headspace was at the time. I don't recall. Yeah. Well, that makes sense, considering some of the other feedback I've gotten about your college True story. (laughs) (laughs) You're not lying. I probably wasn't in a a clear headspace back then, but different different times. Different times. Different different humans. Yeah. Right? Uh, When I went there, I was told it was going to involve some announcing, uh, which was not entirely accurate. There were some other elements about that job that it's probably better that Rob and Derek didn't go there. So I I decided I wanted to leave. And by coincidence, those are the two main sources of my Rowan graduate thesis were the Lakewood Blue Claws as a preamble to try to set up a, a connection networking opportunity for a job and the Wilmington Blue Rocks. Almost simultaneously, the lead announcing position with Lakewood opened up. That person left to go to AAA. And the number two role in Wilmington opened up. And I secured interviews for both on the same day. And I interviewed for the lead job with Lakewood in the morning. And I interviewed for the internship with Wilmington in the afternoon. I did not get the Lakewood job because it was a sales-driven job. And I had no sales experience. They went with someone with sales background. But I did get offered the uh, Wilmington job on the spot. And I took a massive pay cut. At the time, I was making about $45,000 a year, uh, living in a very nice two-bedroom apartment, a job that was honestly very easy but boring and not really what I wanted to do. 
to make $1,200 a month and live in my aunt's basement. And it was the greatest decision I ever made. And that's the part that like, I think some students and maybe you could, you know, talk about this later, John, but like John made the sacrifices Mm -hmm. through his, as he continues to take us through his journey along the lines here, but he made the sacrifices. He didn't just pop out of college and be, and be on the air like he is now. He took the time to go down to Atlanta, leave the family behind, go down there, come back, and then take this much cheaper job. Much cheaper job. Yeah. You know what? I think Rob and I have talked about this before as well, but I always loved broadcast stuff, but I also realized if I really wanted to do it, I was probably going to have to move. And I was not, maybe that's where your head was at. I wasn't, Possibly. I knew in my personality, I don't think I could have left. But I mean, even now, I mean, you really, you really left us. I mean, what's it like to move all around and kind of follow follow the sports jobs where they take you? I was always not only okay with it, I liked it. I like exploring new areas. I like the travel that we get to do. I mean, when I first finished my undergrad, I applied some jobs. If I had gotten something, I would not have gotten graduate school. I would have pursued the job. I applied to sports info jobs. I applied to play-by-play positions. I applied to junior hockey jobs in North Dakota. I applied to Division II jobs in Texas and Minnesota. I applied to community college positions in California, and it never happened. And I was high effort, but it wasn't focused. And that was due to ignorance that I think most of us have at that time. Um, And it was kind of its own good learning curve for me and helped me understand how to best present myself. But it also funnels into when I speak to younger rising announcers, uh, they always want me to give them tape feedback. So in our industry, you would create a, they would still call it a demo tape, even though it's not a tape, it's an electronic file. Uh, but it's just representative of your work. Show me you at your best. And there's there's no true definition to exactly what it is. Some people have five minutes of running play-by-play. Some always have a highlights at the start. Some have multiple cuts. There's no right or wrong. But I tell them constantly, and I believe this with every fiber of my being, more and more with each passing year, your demo doesn't matter. The only ways it matters is if it's truly terrible and you're that bad, then it's never going to happen. I don't care how much you want it or how hard you try. It's just not. And I do think there is a certain innate skill set for those that are going to advance and have real success. If your tape is amazing, you shouldn't be talking to me. You should just be sending your tape to decision makers. If your tape is in between, like most of ours is, most of us are shades of gray, good, never quite finished, polished products, always trying to improve. What separates you is you connecting with the decision maker. It's not your tape. Your tape has to be good enough, but it's separating yourself by making a decision maker like you. How they like you, what they like about you, you can't anticipate or control that. But the number one task is just to connect with people. And that's something that I learned because every single step that I have had along the way is about a connection I made with a person, not in a transactional used car salesman sense, but just trying to be nice and reach out and just connect with people. Yeah, you really may have to make a name for yourself so people can be like, not only does he sound great, but he's great to work with. And he's, I mean, really being nice. Is yeah, just, it's pretty simple. Yeah, it's an important skill that I don't think people really take into consideration. But I think when people like to work with you and you you have a good reputation, that goes a really long way in, in furthering your career. So what happened after you were with the Blue Rocks? How long did you do that for? I wound up there for basically a decade. Uh, I was there as an intern. Uh, I left to go to the New York Yankees. I worked in a full-time role there as their assistant director of scoreboard and broadcasting. And all of these tie into relationships. Um, So the name I mentioned earlier, Jason Weber, super talented, uh, works at NFL Films now. He was at ESPN Major League Baseball Productions before that. When Jason graduated, he wound up at MLB Productions. By circumstance, he wound up winning an Emmy. Uh, There was a a documentary on Cal Ripken's last year in baseball called The Season. And it was the inaugural The Season. It was became a series for, for them after a while. By the way that Jason has told me, the gentleman who was producing it was very aggressive and got sick in spring training. And Jason was nearby doing other work. And they asked Jason to fill in for a week while this guy was recovering from his illness. When the original man came back, uh, he kept transgressing rules that Cal had agreed upon. And 
Cal was going to walk from the project. He had not been committed by signing anything to doing it. Jason uh, was then approached because when they asked Cal, what can we do to save this? He said, bring that guy back that was here for a week because he listened to everything I said. So Jason produced it and won an Emmy and got a promotion. A couple of years later, he was then a person of some more authority and influence. He contacted me and another alumnus, a classmate of his, Rob Ryan, and asked if we wanted to be loggers, which is the entry-level position at Major League Baseball. And I said, yes, yeah, I, I want experience. I went to interview for that job. I didn't get it. I believe it was the nephew of the vice president of finance got the job. My connection wasn't good enough, but they liked me and they remembered me. So a month later, when their logger at Yankee Stadium bailed and I grew up a Yankees fan, they called and said, how would you like to log games at Yankee Stadium? Through that, I met their director of broadcasting. I did some favors for him. Uh, that were not really my job that helped him. I, I showed I could write scripts. I showed that I could voice stuff over. I showed that I could edit. Uh, so another couple of years later, he's creating a job, a full-time liaison between production and broadcasting. And uh, he basically calls and says, how'd you like the job? I'll bring you up for a total token interview and I'll offer you the job as soon as it's over. And this is the details and everything. I said, yes. I go to interview for that the night before his assistant director, had been terminated for improperly sending season ticket holder information to a friend at another New York sports team. Can't do that. That was a hard no, hard no. And I was offered a promotion on the spot and I became the assistant director. And I did that for a year. Then my former boss with the Blue Rocks uh, tried to leverage play to get time off to do some stuff at Sirius XM. It did not work. They wound up calling his bluff on a potential resignation. He had waited until during the year. I think on purpose uh, to try to get through the season. When they called his bluff, they surveyed everyone in the front office and asked, hey, of our last two interns, who'd you like more, John or the other guy? And everybody said, John. And I got offered that lead job. Um, and then years later, the AAA position in Scranton had opened up. I had applied for and been a finalist for multiple other AAA jobs, all of which to varying degrees wanted ownership. They wanted to limit my ability to freelance with other entities. I was already working nationally for ESPN and Westwood One, um, and yet they didn't want to pay anything. So they wanted to give no contract, pay me twenty something thousand dollars a year, and tell me I can't go call ESPN events on a November Saturday when I have nothing to do for them. But Scranton was the closest I could be to home and to my family, my wife's family, um, and the same thing happened. I called and called. I got no response. Nothing was happening. Then I get a call from my former boss at the Yankees who says, hey, how would you like to be the announcer at Scranton? It's like, uh, yeah, why? Did they call you? Well, yeah, but not for the reasons you think. They called the COO of the Yankees and said, who do you want to be at AAA? And I don't think he really cared. So he gave it to me, and I said, you should hire John, and you're going to get a phone call. And in 10 minutes, the guy I had been calling for the last month who wouldn't take my phone call called me back and said, hey, how'd you like to come interview? And My whole career has been circumstances like that. And that's where I tell young folks, and I firmly believe this, that you need to have goals. You need to strive for them. But you're not always going to achieve the exact goal that you want. While you're looking for A, B, C, and D are going to pop up. And it's at your discretion if you go for them. But I don't think B, C, and D arrive unless you're going for A, unless you're driven to one particular thing. I'm showing pictures over here as you're talking, John, of the crew coming to see you in Scranton. Because a bunch of us, when John mm -hmm. was calling games... Myself, Derek, Jay, Kaz, Bruce, and all head up to town to uh, see him every year. He would get us these Rail Rider bucks, and uh, we'd occasionally use them, and then, you know, he'd use them in the stadium and have fun. Oh, you guys are <laughs> cute. I think that's the same day, by the way. This picture might be the same day I interviewed for the, for the role here. Really? Yeah. You yeah. have your um, signature Boston Red Sox hat on. Yeah, yeah, that's been, that's going in the casket with me. Which is my favorite way to see Rob, because we, you know, we work together, so yeah. I see Rob in a lot of the suit awful. stuff, which it's is awful. like terrible but when i see rob in that boston red sox hat you know like, it's there's my friend yeah <laughs> yeah he's under there yeah. he's got to take off this batman suit but no but joe john that's that's huge for like for because i do think that there's a misconception amongst uh younger people that oh yeah well, i'm just going to be a broad on the broadcast i'm going to be on air you have to put your time into so many of these sort of different pieces so now john as you as you sort of let's let's fast forward a little bit you go and you get this new gig 
A, tell us about the new gig that you're currently in out in Midwest, because I know you have a bunch of gigs. So you can tell, talk to us all about them. And then talk to us about like that that interview process, like how you then went down, how you got that opportunity. Sure. Uh, well, I'm very fortunate that now my main job is I call the Cincinnati Reds baseball games on television. So we made the move to greater Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and that came about uh, when COVID hit. I had no work for almost a calendar year. Most of freelance sports slammed on the brakes. So I made no money. I had nothing to do. And I went for long walks almost daily. And when I say long, I mean like two and a half, three hour walks almost every day. And I spent most of that time on self-reflection thinking about what can or should I do. And some of it, I was just really depressed. I mean, I, I was I was down. And at one point, I just said, this is dumb. I'm gaining nothing by doing this. I'm just wallowing in self-pity. This is this is an opportunity. And uh, so I, I made sure to take that time and I wrote every person that ever helped me in any way to say thank you and connect with them. And some of them, we never had a falling out. We just, you know, you lose touch. And I wrote every team in Major League Baseball and the NBA uh, because my goal had been, and it became all the more accented at that point, to be a lead announcer of an NBA or Major League Baseball team, ideally on television. I thought that's where the greatest job security was. That's where the greatest uh, financial incentive would be. That's where my skills, I think, would be used the best. That's where I think I'd have the most fun. But also, bluntly, in our industry, first-year lead announcers generally do not get hired at age 50+. plus. In fact, if anything is an industry, it's been going the opposite direction. It's more 30-somethings that are getting it. I think multiple reasons. I think so they don't have to hire for the role again. I think it helps control finances to some extent. And I think it's about the press release and the overall look of it. Every ticking year to me was a percentage less chance that I could even get that job. And if I didn't get that job by the time I'm 50, then I'm thinking I'm likely going to have to career pivot in my working lifetime. I'm going to have to and probably want to work until I'm 70 something. If I work until then in my current roles, my bosses are either going to be dead or fired or go somewhere else or they're going to lose the rights. And something outside of my control doesn't mean I lose all my work, but something will change, likely not for the better, within my working lifetime out of my control. So I wrote every team to try to connect with them, including the Reds. What the did time. you say? Just said, this is who I am. This is what I've done. I'd love to be considered for any possible future openings. And I'm just looking to chat with you for five minutes to introduce myself. Um, the hit rate was very low. It's something I'd done many times before with varying degrees of success. And, uh, and I've been a finalist for multiple other positions, uh, several jobs in the NBA and in Major League Baseball. Some of them I was that close. I was the runner up and it was emotionally devastating when I did not get it. So then the, the red situation months after I had written them with no response, my agent calls I'm doing a college basketball game in North Jersey, it's COVID. So we're doing it off a monitor and the Tony Soprano esque, like, uh, I've seen Dumb pictures. I've seen, I've seen pictures of those. <laughs> it was it was not a pretty environment. And he says, "How would you like to interview to be the Cincinnati Reds television announcer?" And my honest answer in the moment was, "Yeah, that sounds great." A little understated, and he got mad, and uh, rightfully so. And he's like, "What? This is really disappointing. Why are you not excited about this? This is an amazing job." I said, "Yeah, that's that's not why I'm acting that way. It's because." I've been so close so many times before where I knew a major decision maker. I don't know anybody at the Cincinnati Reds. So in my mind, like they want to interview three or five or whatever. And I'm the third or fifth person because my resume kind of matches. And, but someone else is going to know somebody and I'm not going to get it. So I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to put on the face. And I do want it. But it's like somebody's been through a lot of bad breakups. And, you know, you're a little more guarded when you start dating again. I just thought there was almost a zero chance I'd actually get the job. So why get that pumped and emotionally invested? But then it turns out that after he said kind of crestfallen, um, well, all right, well, you're going to have an interview with this guy and he's running the search. And I heard the names like he ran another search where I was incredibly close. He liked me. We stayed in touch for like two years. But I didn't realize that he left there and went to there. Oh, my gosh. I actually know somebody. I have a chance at this. And that totally changed my perception. And uh, so I wound up having a phoner with somebody on the TV side for about an hour. And then I had a video chat with somebody on the team side in the ownership group 
also for about 45 minutes or so. And then I had another Zoom with a, another rung up on the team side. And that's part of what complicates these jobs because in most cases, you technically work for the rights holder, the TV or radio network with team approval. But the truth is for many of them, I don't know this universally, but talking to my friends that work at other teams, the team really decides. You know, the, the, the rights holder presents options, and then the team says that one. Every passing step in the process, it became, to me, I think, a greater and greater likelihood. I started to recognize, like, I, I think this is going to happen. Like, I, I can't believe it. If you would have asked me in the very beginning, I said, no shot. I, I can't believe it. It's actually going to happen. And it, and it did. I've got to ask, because you've got so many different roles. And we've, I think we've, we may have talked about this before, but I don't remember. You obviously work for the Reds. You do Navy football. You do all these pieces, Westwood One. So you work with all of these different color commentators. Is there one that, when you're first starting to work with them, that you grew up with them either as a, as a, as a child or a kid, that you were like, I can't believe I'm calling a game with this guy? Is there somebody that comes to mind? Oh, a bunch. Yeah. I mean, almost all of them, honestly. Uh, Barry Larkin doing the Reds games. Randy Cross doing uh, major college football for CBS. I've called games with uh, the late outstanding coach, John Thompson, with Tim Brown. Yes, uh, Mike Mayock. I, I mean, almost everybody I've worked with. It's kind of like, you know, one of these things is not like the other. And it's you, me, I, I'm the odd one out. Like, why is this schmuck here next to somebody <laughs> of actual credentials and legitimacy? Yeah, that's been one of the great things about the job is getting to meet and getting to know all the people that I've worked with. And how do you prep to call a game, what I feel like sports folks are particularly interesting where they just have this like wheelhouse of historical knowledge and just an ability to memorize players numbers and all that good stuff. What's it like for you to prepare for this, especially because you're not just doing it for one team. So you have to have a, a lot of information. How do you prepare for that? How do you keep that all straight? Um, well, I have spotting boards, particularly for a football and basketball that, that help a lot that I construct on my own. They're different by sport and by medium. Uh, if I'm on radio, I don't need nearly as much information because uh, my radio these days is generally Westwood One, and there's just not enough time to tell a lot of stories. You have to know the big headlines. You need to know what numbers are, are up, but we have so many reads for commercials and for promos, and you got to make sure your analyst is part of it. It doesn't have nearly as much info as when I do a television game. Um, and NFL... I don't need to tell the listener who Lamar Jackson is. They, they know who he is. Where if I'm doing a college game and it's ECU against Tulane, there are a lot of viewers that are outside of friends and family don't know who any of these players are. So I have to have more background and bio information. So it, it depends upon the event. But I would say the rough numbers for a college football game, probably about 30 to 40 hours that go into every game between – watching film, watching press conferences, talking to coaches, going to a practice, creating the boards, looking at stats, talking to our, our entire crew, having production meetings. Basketball is probably closer to 10 to 15 hours. Um, it's, you know, 10 half naked people that are readily identifiable. The teams are not nearly as deep. So it's, it's a lot easier to do. And then baseball is kind of in between, but baseball is more, especially now that I'm doing major league baseball, uh, I don't have to introduce as many of the players. It's more about trends. And I have running documents that I just update with each series, let alone annually. So I'm not redoing it every single time. So your 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 travel rewards must be amazing with all yeah. the stuff that you're doing, right? Get like those warm I mean, you must be you're home for like milk. five days. Are you like home for five days a year? Yeah, what's what's that like? Because you're a family guy. Tell us about that quote unquote work life balance. It's hard. I mean, that's I think a lot of people look at the work that I do, especially the random folks you'll meet on the plane and whatnot, and they say that must be amazing. And it is. I chose this path because I love it. I love calling games. I love traveling. But if you ask what's the hardest thing, it's being away. It's, I mean, it's something Rob could attest to because, you know, we have been great friends for a long time. I've had to miss weddings. I've had to miss funerals. I've had to miss major birthdays. I've had to miss vacations. Uh, I've had to miss major holidays. I, uh, I wasn't at Christmas with my my mom and dad for eight years, nine years, because I, I had games. The good and bad of our industry is that once you're in and you, word of mouth passes and you forge relationships, you'll constantly be asked back, barring some crazy unforeseen circumstances or you doing something tragically stupid. 
But the downside of that is the first time you say no, you're probably not the first call the next time. And the odds of that person saying no, and then they call you, are not very good. And no matter how entrenched or established you are, there is a certain incumbent need to always say yes. If nothing else, just for self-preservation, let alone the fact that you want to do it and it does pay money. And yes, there are other positive attributes to it. But if you want to have the chance to do it, you have to say yes. And that's that's really hard. When I was single, I embraced all of it. Uh, as I've aged and now we have a 10-year-old and I'm married, and it's it's hard. It's, uh, it's a choice. There are many people who live much harder lives, especially those that are in service to our country. But it, th- th- that's the downside is you miss a lot. What's your favorite city? You've been to so many. Is there one? We won't go to least favorite because I feel like that's just not a good thing. No, We're a don't. positive show. Yeah, sure. Right? Uh-huh. Favorite city that you've um, been to? I'm going to give you two answers. So my favorite ballpark when I do baseball is San Francisco. Football, I love going to Lambeau Field. Basketball, I I would say it was probably the United Center when I had a chance to work for the Bulls. But city, I love greater San Diego, California. If money and family were not the appropriate and significant concerns that they are, cost of living, meaning money, I would have moved there 15 years ago and lived in a 400-square-foot hovel by myself just to be I, – I love it. I love that area of Southern California. They say it's great. You ever been there? Southern California? Yeah. yeah, I have family there. Do you really? Yeah, actually, Brian and I both have family there, and we keep saying that we need to get out there, but it's just putting a four-year-old and a two-year-old on a plane for five hours. It's just... The San Diego, they that say That sounds great. harder than John's job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would... I don't know if this is, like, an appropriate question because I don't know if the Reds would get mad, but would you love to call for the Yankees? Would that be the dream as, like, a kid that grew up watching the Yankees? Are you like, this is the dream, I'm living it? What is, like, when you're in your role, what's next? Like, what do you what do you strive for? What are you, what are you shooting for? Well, to be honest, the, the idea of what's next is kind of a, a hard realization when you achieve a dream like this because I think for anyone who has that kind of success in any industry, you have to be pretty driven. Uh, You have to be pushing and striving a lot. Even if you enjoy a lot of success along the way, there's still always that hunger. And I think it's the human condition to always want more, to normalize to whatever it is. There really is nothing more. And it's hard to turn that off. When I read trades and I see like, you know, other, because I work for CBS nationally and I work for Westwood One, and I'll see things that happen to peers or, you know, uh, competitors in the industry And immediately my mind goes to like, well, what's the domino to come from that? Because it was always, well, what job could that open that I should try to get in front of? I I don't want another job. And most of my childhood allegiances are not there. The the only one that really still exists for me is uh, the sport I actually loved the most. I loved all of them. The one I loved the most in my most formative sports years, my like middle to high school years was hockey. What I played the most. The 93, 94 New York Rangers are my favorite single sports team of all time. And I say that in part because I've never called NHL hockey. I've never seen how the sausage is made. So I've, I've never met a hero that fell short of what my vision was of that person. So crystallized forever in my head are Mark Messier and Brian Leach and Adam Graves and Mike Richter and uh, you know, Essa Tikkanen as just being these rock stars. And hopefully they are, but I'll, Likely never know because I've never called NHL hockey. With everything else, the more you meet people, I find myself, I mean, outside of, yes, I have an allegiance to the team I call games for. I want to see them win. I, uh, the idea of a team announcer is like, I'm totally impartial. That's ridiculous. They write your check. That's stupid. <laughs> uh, now, you have to call it like it is, and you don't you know, tell things through rose-tinted glasses. But at the same time, yes, you want your team to win. But you find yourself outside of that like rooting for people. I come across coaches and players that are good people that I like. And even if they're in some other uniform or doing something else, I want them to succeed. And you come across not good people. And you're not as upset if things don't go well for them. So I I think for me, you know, this is a great place to raise families. We love living here. The team is incredibly good to me. That honestly is, is, if you want to call it that, I think it's an overstatement or it's not quite appropriate, but a challenge of achieving your dream is if once you're on that mountaintop, there is no next. And so learning to just be in those moments can be its own, you know, hurdle of sorts because you're just wired to think a certain way and you got to turn that off. 
So we talked about some of the challenges about you kind of standing on that mountaintop. What is the most rewarding part of of the position that you're in now? And uh, and any thoughts about like you know coaching or mentoring the next generation? I, I know you talked about like you like the idea of teaching. Any thoughts about that or any opportunities for you to do that where you are? Yeah, the uh, the greatest thing about it is the getting to enjoy it, getting to actually be there and the relative stability that it gives you in an industry that really doesn't have any. Because I tell, I, I try to help young folks all the time. I get random messages on Twitter, on LinkedIn. People find my email address. And I always try to take time to help the next generation uh, in large part because a number of people helped me and still help me to this day. Uh, and the only thing I ask of them is to pay it forward that when they actualize their success to do the same for the next wave. But I, I try to share with all of them that I think the industry right now is the greatest it's ever been to start. I think you have better, more abundant opportunities, production quality, compensation, everything is better out of the gate today than it's ever been. I also think, and I'm just being honest, it's the worst time ever as a career path because everything is freelance. There's a great impermanence to a lot of it. Uh, and you have to be willing to roll with a lot of heavy punches that particularly if you choose to become a family person, you have kids, you're married, and you're relying on income to help provide for more than yourself, that can be really hard. Uh, you will likely have to career pivot multiple times during your life, and several of them might not be of your choice, and that's hard. But at the same time, I would say the industry is awesome. I love it. I would still do it. But I just want you to know the full breadth of what I think is going on right now. Um, and so I do help people regularly. And uh, and honestly, my other option, when I, as I mentioned earlier, I thought the odds of getting this kind of a role at 50 plus was borderline impossible. So my plan was, if I hadn't achieved this within this window, was to go into some form of higher education, ideally at Rowan. Because that's where I knew everybody, and that's where that's what gave me an opportunity, and I'd like to give back and uh, and do exactly that. Be in some kind of uh, whether it's helping Neil Hartman with the sport communication stuff right now, or helping Derek in some capacity at GLS, or something similar at another university. And it would likely have been somewhere in New Jersey, Delaware Valley area, because that's where my family was, my wife's family was, and then still freelance because I think in most of those roles they would encourage that. I nearly did that when I was in Wilmington. Uh, during that time, I interviewed for a student media advisory role at Villanova. And uh, within that interview, they pointed out, similar to the other baseball opportunities, hey, we see you do all these other events. Just know that would have to go away if you were to do this. And to me, that was the deal breaker. And, and I did not go further than that step in the process. I also thought it was short-sighted. Like, wait a minute. You want somebody advising your students that has zero connection to working in the industry? That makes no yeah. sense. Like, I, I get it if you want me to cut down, you don't want me to miss your Monday to Friday days. That's more than fair. But on a night weekend, you don't want me to do anything so I could have some, like a toe in the industry to inform them. But, and I think perceptions of that have changed. And that was, you know, in 2005, six, somewhere in that range. And that was my plan. And, uh, and I still could see myself doing that because, you know, I'm really lucky to be where I am. Uh, and while this gives me, my greatest sense of permanence and security that I could reasonably ask for in our industry, it is still the same industry that I'm advising these kids about. Something could happen outside of my control that this could go away. It could go away next year. It could go away 10 years from now. And then I'm still likely going to want to work until I'm 65 to 70 years old. Uh, if the, another similar situation didn't arise, which is not mathematically likely, granted the few number of roles, that's what I'd want to do. I, I'd want to help the next wave of of sports announcers. Well, we wish you lots of career success, but we would love to see you back at Rowan in yeah. some sort of official capacity. How do we do that? I you have that know. power, right? Don't you have that? Yeah. Oh, yes. I do all the hiring. And You've been here longer than I have been. No, like by like two years okay. <laughs> or a year. I don't even know. But we're so glad that you came on. And John, I think the most important thing that everyone needs to know is um, you're very active on social media and you always sign the same things to any kind of row in um, social media. So um, I think it would only be appropriate if we had you, you know, kind of do a sign off as maybe you would on social media and give us a little, you know what I'm asking for, John. <laughs> to all of Rowan, John Sadak, classes of 2000, 2003. Go Profs!
Owl emoji. Rob. Yep. I really loved this um, interview with John. Obviously, a super talented guy. Great roots here to the station. What I didn't get in the interview, which I was hoping, okay. was... More talk about Rob as a college student. Oh my gosh! No, we can't do those stories. That'll be like on an Easter egg on a DVD. Do we still do DVDs or no? Do we? Like no, me and you? Like, no. They put the Easter eggs like the hidden tracks. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe that can be like uh, a different episode. Yeah, like a secret, a secret song. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we could we could do that, but um, I still don't know about college Rob, and I've known you a long time, so I was hoping he could give me some insight. But you guys are tight because he didn't give you up at all. No, that was good. And thank you for that, Johnny. I appreciated that. The cool part about Johnny is listening to him on air. Like, Are you calling him Johnny? I am calling him that's Johnny. Because so that's what I do. I call him Johnny. Is that a, <laughs> is that a thing? Can I, mean, I call Can I call a guest Johnny? I mean, it, that's, if it's okay by him, that's okay. fine by me. You I call him whatever okay. you want. I think it's okay. But you'll be, I remember, um, we'll be hearing him on air. And I'm just like, let me just text the broadcaster right now. So I would yeah. text him and say, like, sounding good, Johnny. And he like, he would get right back to you, like during the game. So yeah. like as he was doing the thing, it's like, all right, how many of the people are texting the the, the broadcaster at the time and they're paying attention to you? But Ryan's got- always texting Derek when Derek's on air. Oh, I didn't think about that actually. Yeah, yeah. You have a BFF. You could also be texting. I've got too on many air. people on on broadcast. So many important people what? in your life. How do you function? You know what? I should be a guest on this show. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you are somebody. Somebody book. Somebody week. book me. No, but John was a great interview, and he does still come back to the university and, and he participates in sort of the sports communication program that we have here in our um, Rick Edelman College of Communication with, he, with Neil Hartman. And, yeah, and he loves Rowan. Like it's like the way that I was introduced to John is basically because I work in the alumni office. Yeah. And if anything that we post, he's right, it's GoProfs. And I'm like, yeah, you ca- like you still like, you know, you've made it, you've succeeded, you're doing big things and you still care about this place because it was so influential in, in his life. And I just think that that's really neat that you can kind of remember where he came from and where your roots are. Yeah, he really honed his craft here at GLS. So really awesome to have him back here on the podcast and still promoting the university the way he does. And it's it's just like it's 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 cool to have that like Syracuse University, great school for communication. Absolutely, yeah. But Rome University, we're 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 right up there with him. I know. Happy baseball season, profs. What a timely interview we got with John right before baseball season got really nutty so we're just very grateful to have had john and we have more amazing guests coming up on beyond the brown and gold so stay tuned you've been listening to beyond the brown and gold on rowan radio 89.7 wgls fm you can find more episodes on your favorite podcasting platforms by searching for beyond the brown and gold or rowan radio on demand 